Good morning. This is a day the Lord has made, and I ask that you join me in rejoicing and being glad. I'm Richard Allen Washington, and I serve as a virtual pastor, and I'm excited to have you worshiping God through the Word on this wonderful Sunday. It is a good day to learn, to lean, and to love God's Word. We are a people who belong together, trying to make it in life. We are people who believe in the word of God and believe every promise that God's word has said that we shall become and we are becoming. I want to share this with you. You are not anything close to what you used to be. You're not exactly where God destined you to be and you're not where you quote unquote want to be. But honey, I've come to tell you, you are certainly not what you used to be. And because of that, we can offer God all the praise we have because God has been allowing you and me to develop and become greater each and every day. This is your first day of a new week to give God your best and to hear God's word to help you position yourself this week to be your best. I'm excited. I pray that you can join us in worshiping God through the word and the study of the word and the preaching moment of the word. I believe that there is a word for you in this message that God is prepared and God has ready to be delivered to you. So once again, welcome to our experience where we give God all of the praise through the word. Let me encourage you to listen carefully to those announcements. Make prayer your discipline. Make giving your choice today and make the word your witness for the goodness of God is in your life. Let's go to God through prayer and let's hear what God has to say for each one of us. God, we thank you. We pause. I'm in a sanctuary and others are in different spaces, but glory to you that we can connect together no matter where we are. We ask that you would transform the spaces that we're currently residing in that are not sanctuaries into virtual sanctuaries. Help us to have a holy moment where your oil can drip from the word into our life. We need protection, we need provision, and Lord, we need production not for the material gains of this world, God, but for the spiritual kingdom that you are birthing in each one of us. We belong with other believers. We believe in your word and we are becoming everything that you have destined us to be. I'm inviting you now, God, to have your way in this space, to take this your servant and use me for your glory. I pray that someone would hear you and see you and become greater this week because you have spent time in me and giving it to them. So Lord, let me preach your word and I will give you glory. Through Christ Jesus, I say to you, thank you. And as a family, we say, amen. Thank you so very much. It's a joy to be with you. I wanna go right into the word of God on this wonderful September Sunday. I'm just praying eventually that the cold weather will come on in here, change some leaves around so we can transition out of that heat until some wonderful, cool fall weather. Am I alone? Do I have a witness? I hope so. Listen, I want to invite you to the New Testament this week. In the, in the New Testament, I want to invite you to join me in the Gospel of St. John. John's Gospel happens to be in the New Testament, and it falls behind what? Mark? No. It falls behind Luke. Yes. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John, that's, that is outside of the Synoptic Gospel, stands alone for its creativity, its culture, and I want to say it, its courage. Join me in John chapter 3. Everybody knows what that is, right? Everybody knows where John chapter 3 is. I want to encourage you to join me in John chapter 3. And when you get to John chapter 3, I want you to turn to verse number 1 and hang right there as we share this word. Listen for the word of God. Now there was a man named Nicodemus who happened to be a Pharisee. Nicodemus was a ruler among the Jews. This man came to Jesus at night and said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher and you come from God, for no one can do the things that you do 
unless they be sent by God. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say this to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and become born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say this to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and to that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to Jesus, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Moses was lifted up and lifted the servant in, serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Amen. On this, the Lord's Sunday, I want to ask that you would join me in thinking with me and contemplating with me on this subject, church folk, church folk. My brothers and sisters, back in 2002, there was a book that was birthed by an African-American woman, Andrea Bowen, Andrea Michelle Bowen to be exact. She created and wrote a book entitled Church Folk. It was a fictitious, a non-fictitious, a nonfiction book that captured many stories and many testimonies of persons who were real. She took their testimonies and placed them in the lives of fictitious characters and gave the book the name Church Folk. Church Folk is one of my favorite nonfiction books and often I've read it at least once a year. It's a fascinating and full colorful book that gives a picturesque design, if you will, and voice to what happens in the black church culture known as uh, black church living. It's a great book. And if you haven't had a chance to read it, I would suggest that you do. And if you have had a chance to read it, it is a great uh, parameter, if you will, to see just how authentic you are working with God through people in your Christian journey. It's a fascinating book that tells about life and how God's people who are called by God, positioned by God, have to deal with people in the church, and it's called church folk. Whether we are close-up disciples or we have just entered into the Christian lifestyle, we have all experienced church folk. Church folk are the people who are in the church, well, but the church is not in them. Church folk are the people that attend worship experiences in a sanctuary, but worship doesn't enter into them and they aren't worshiping God. Church folk know what everybody wears, what everybody smells like, and what everybody was looking like on a Sunday, but they can't remember the word that was preached, read, or sang through worship and praise. Church folk, are people who can tell you more about what the rumor mill has said instead of what the righteousness of God in scripture. Church folk never lean in to the prayer calls that are Monday and Friday or sometimes on Wednesday. 
Church folk never tune in to Bible study. Church folk never attend Bible study. Church folk always find their way, watch this, to a church meeting, but never to a church fellowshipping moment. Church folk can show up to a 7 p.m. meeting, but they can't show up to a 10 a.m. Sunday school class. Church folk know what you did last week, and they know what you ate for dinner yesterday. Church folk, are the people that are in church, but church is not in them. Church folk are the people that are often representatives of the church world on the outside to the media, to the non-believer, to children and to young adults and some seasoned adults who have given up on church because of them. Church folk know more about God and less about praying with God and meditating to God than the preachers of the gospel. Church folk, know how everything should be run, know why it's not being run, but they are not willing to do what it takes, watch this, to make the circumstances run. Everybody has an experienced family with some church folk. And maybe I'm in your Kool-Aid, maybe if you haven't, you might be church folk. Maybe if you haven't, you are related to sleep beside or eat with some church folk. I am not certain which are you, but I do know that God has a word for if you are encountering church folk. As a pastor, I know church folk when I see them. I can smell church folk when they enter and they're a hundred yards away. I can understand what is entering the mindset of church folk because I've had a history of dealing with them. But the Bible in today's lesson introduces us to a biblical church folk. Have mercy. There are people even in the Bible that fit the description of church folk. In the third chapter of the Gospel of John, John is a colorful writer and he takes upon himself the courageous, the courage, if you will, to present church folk in a light that allows those who read and who listen know how to handle church folk. In the third chapter, before you get to the famous for God so loved the world, you got to deal with church folk. Let me pause and place here a hermeneutical kickstand for Carrie. Yes, let me pause and put down a hermeneutical kickstand for my friend in Arkansas, Kim. Let me pause and place a kickstand in her hermeneutical direction for my family down in Florida, Tampa area, Tampa D. Let me share with you right here that in the third chapter early on, you need to recognize before God so loved the world is written and penned church folk are on the scene. Let me pause and say to you before you can get to the breakthrough that God has de designed and destined for you, you're going to have to wrestle and go through some church folk. I'm going to say it again. If you're wondering why you're dealing with church folk, let me assure you that a blessing is on the horizon. Let me assure you that if you're confronting and having to handle and are being challenged by church folk, the folk that know better than you what to do, but ain't never set where you sat. Let me encourage you because the Lord is developing you through patience and the Lord is developing you through giving you skills and knowing how to maturely deal with them in such a way that you are going to be elevated and gifted a blessing by God. You don't understand it. Before God pins through the gospel writer John for God so loved the world that he gave. God had to deal, watch this, with the Nicodemus church person in order to get, watch this, to giving Jesus Christ to the world. I, I, I need to bag that up and flip it and share it with you in the context that you can really embrace it. The word of God from verses one through 13 is setting us up for John three sixteen. John 3.16 is one of the most popularly quoted scriptures in the world in human history. And before it comes to the scene, the context of John 3.16 is built upon dealing with church folk. Here's what I'm trying to get you to understand this morning. That before God can bless your generational wealth with a word that stands two generations from now, maybe four generations from now, God's got to send you through dealing with people so that when the word comes, it's solid and sure. So the storm, the challenge, the frustration, the illness, 
the problem, the bankruptcy, the over the, the overwhelming circumstance is all a setup for you. So that when now when John 316 shows up in your life, which means when God delivers through you a message of testimony about God's love to the generations you are birthing and are positioning yourself for in your family and in your community, you got to deal with some church folk stuff. So if you are dealing with some church folk stuff, I need you to recognize that just around this corner is a breakthrough moment that will bless your generation and two coming forward. I'm preaching to you right now so you can throw your hands up and give God praise that what you're going through now is positioning you to bless the people who are not yet born in your bloodline. Listen, God calls us, each and every one of us, to deal with church folk. Nicodemus, the word tells us, comes to Jesus by night. And if you have any biblical sense and any biblical understanding, you know that he comes to Jesus by night because he's embarrassed that he doesn't have the clear understanding of who Jesus is. But watch this, he doesn't want other church folk, watch this, he doesn't want other church folk to know he's approaching Jesus. You know, you always got somebody like that in your life. They don't want anybody else to know that they are connected to you in the way that they are. And so they call you, they reach out to you at night to keep others from knowing their business. Let me pause and share this with you. If somebody only wants to best with you at the nighttime, if they never talk about plans to be with you in the daytime, if you got people that want to hide you in their life, baby, you need to pull back and make sure that the investment that you are making in them and that they are making in you is something that you really want to do. I hear you. I hear you. I know the circumstances can be challenging, but I want you to know that every now and then Nicodemus will show up even in our world. He comes to Jesus by night because he doesn't want to be embarrassed and he doesn't want the people he's been hanging with woo, to catch him hanging with Jesus. Come here. I want to pause and say something must have been said about Jesus in the daytime with the people he's hanging with that keeps him from wanting them to see him with Jesus at night. If somebody has been talking about you and saying the wrong thing about you, they will get funny when you say, let's go hang out. Because they don't want anybody that they have been talking low down and bad about you to see them with you. Do I have any witness or company in here? The text says that he comes to Jesus by night and he says to Jesus, look at him. Listen, we know you're, you're from God. We know you're a teacher from God because nobody, unless they're with God, can do what you do. Church folk try to dress everything up. They try to dress everything up in religious language. You got to be careful about the people in your life, preach pastor, that can actually dress up what they're trying to tell you and set you up for in religious jargon. Come in, Nikki. I just want to know this truth. Is there anybody looking and listening right now, Glenda? Is there anybody looking and listening that can testify that sometimes folk try to dress up their <laughs> statements, conversation, and other things in what I call God language, hiding some of the stuff that really ain't about God. Listen, we call that in, in my CPE training and development, my certification, we call that hiding in God language, where people say, you know, the Lord is this and God is that, trying to dress up their own feelings about you or a circumstance and clothe it in God language because people get afraid when you put God language around foolishness. Because some folk cannot discern, family, that everything that's in God language ain't of God. Nicodemus tries to dress stuff up in God language. And so you got to be careful that the people that are coming to you, I said what I said, are not dressing some stuff up in God language when it's really their feelings by themselves. Some stuff. People, church folk, let me say it. Some stuff church folks say, God ain't in. God ain't in some of the things that we've heard people say. 
and they have dressed it up in God language, but it's really their insecurity, their sense of jealousy, and their unwillingness to trust the process that they cannot control. Preach, Pastor. The text says he comes to Jesus by night, dresses up his gar jargon in God language and says cute nuances to Jesus. And Jesus is not shaken nor stirred by any of it. Hear me. Jesus, in hearing him say, we know that you're a teacher in this kind of thing. And, 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 and Jesus says, wait a minute, let me cut across the field on you. And before you get into a long discourse about what you think, let me tell you that you can't even come in to see the kingdom of God if you have not been born again. I want to pause and say that is the first thing I need you to know about church folk and how to handle them. Church folk have not been born again. Church folk are people who can talk God, but they don't know God. Watch this, because they have not been born again through God. And so you got to recognize this truth this morning, that every time you encounter church folk, stop expecting Christian-like behavior from people who are church folk. Everybody who suggests that they are of the church doesn't have Christ in them and won't behave like Christ. And so your feelings can be hurt. Your, your, your decisions can be distorted because you are basing your decision and your feeling off of somebody that appears to be godly, but they are church folk disguised in godly language. I hope this is reaching you. How do you handle church folk? Here is what Jesus shows us. We handle church folk the way he handles Nicodemus. And we ain't mad at Nick. We thank God for Nick because he's showing us what church folk really look like. Nick dresses up and uses religious conversation to draw Jesus in, watch this, to really discover what he needs to know. Don't ever think that church folks, matter of fact, let me just say this, as your virtual pastor, be careful when people dress everything up in God language. Because I'm going to tell you, if you can't talk plain, to people, directly to people, without saying so much God language, what you got to say ain't of God, it's spoken out of fear and insecurity. Listen, I want to help somebody right here. Some of us need to know the difference between godly people and folk who use God language to try to get close to you and bleed on you. Text says, Jesus says, Unless you are born again, you can't even see the kingdom. Here, here is what you got to recognize. Church folk will never be able to see the things that God has deposited in you. Church folk will never be able to catch the vision that God has gifted the congregation because they can't see it happening without them in the way. Church folk can't see the kingdom of God because, that they, are, because they are not of God. So Jesus wants us to understand how to handle church folk. Cut the chase with them and tell them you can't see what God has for me because maybe you are not of the God that has sent the message and the vision through me. That'll bag them up right there. But what does God want us to catch in this text? First of all, he says you got to be born again. Church folk, before you become a Christian, before you become a disciple, Jesus says you must be born again. Nicodemus is on track. He is a church folk, but he can be born again. How? Because he does the first step that everyone who wants to be born again must experience. He encounters Jesus. I want to be clear. Church folk, you come to church every week and don't encounter Christ. Sometimes we can go a whole year without having ever encountered Jesus. And that's a problem in the kingdom of God. Maybe that's why you haven't seen the vision. Maybe that's why you haven't seen God move in other people's life. Maybe that's why you're not empathetic. Maybe that's why you are self-centered and selfish because you have not been born again. Being born again 
helps you to understand that there is something at work in this world that's greater than you and you have to give of yourself to be greater in the first place. The text says he encounters Jesus. It's tailor-made to teach us that we have to encounter Jesus if we're going to be born again. And I got to be honest, what's an encounter? It's having a face-to-face -face experience with God through Christ Jesus. Some of us are Christian or claim to be, but we're not born again. To be born again means I have met Christ. I have met Jesus. I have encountered him. I have had dialogue with him. I have had an experience where he has transformed my thinking and my behavior because I recognize that there is something greater at work in my life. Is there anybody who has encountered him and has came from the encounter recognizing that I cannot go the way I used to go. I cannot be who I used to be. There is something more in store in life than what I have been through. Text says, Jesus encounters Nicodemus and Nicodemus encounters Jesus. And they begin a dialogue. In the dialogue, Jesus gets real with him. You know, I like that about Christ. He doesn't let you be fake with him. You're going to have to be real with him. And, and I want to share this. If you really want to meet him and talk with him and engage with him, just be real with him. Just go to him, not dressing up your prayers, but just tell him, I need you. If you want him to act and move in your circumstance, don't dress up anything. Just be honest with him. He can handle the pain and the frustration and the desire of your heart. He will have you take on his yoke because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. But you got to encounter him. And when you encounter him and you're real with him, here's what happens. You engage him. Nicodemus has an encounter that leads to an engagement. The engagement is the conversation where Nick says, I can't be fake with him. I got to be real with him. And he is actually overwhelmed because he's got, watch this, all of this knowledge, all of this understanding, all of this wisdom, worldly, but cannot handle the spiritual things that God has for you. I need to put this kickstand right here and say that we have done a poor job telling young people, old people, and middle-aged people that you got to advance in education through the system. You got to advance in career and job title and position. You got to have all your ducks in a row. And that qualifies you to be somebody that God has blessed. The devil is a huge liar. You don't have to have any of that in order for God to bless you and take you from the bottom and put you at the top. Start at the bottom. Now we're here. Listen. God doesn't need you to have any of your business in order. And we need to stop telling people that. We like people to have stuff in order because it makes us feel good. But honey, God can take what's out of order and put it in order. Matter of fact, that's how we got the world we live in. God took chaos and organized it. God can take what's chaotic in your world right now, what's out of control, what you don't understand, what's full of darkness, preach pastor, what you cannot comprehend and give it order and direction. And you'll be saying, order my steps in your word, order my tongue in your word. You'll be walking in chaos and order will follow you all the days of your life. That's how God is able to work. When you have encountered him, he leads you to engage him. You got to be born again. Listen, born again, encounter leads to engagement. And what is engaging? Nicodemus starts to be honest with Christ and tell him what he doesn't know. Woo! Woo! Look, I got to get out of here. But I got to give you this. Nick says clearly, how can this be? He leaves his understanding. You know, he came to Jesus. You didn't catch the, I didn't tell you this, but let me make it live for you. You know, Nicodemus came at night, problem number one. He tells Jesus in religious jargon, God language, all of this stuff. He's trying to tell Jesus, I know you and I know God and, and I can talk God things with you. But it doesn't work because God through Christ Jesus gives him truth. When somebody hits you with truth, all your lies fall to the ground. 
When somebody hits you with revelatory word, then what's fake in your life will disappear. Listen, I told him last Sunday, you're fake, baby. That's what Ale Alexander O'Neill talked. You're fake. And then I came and tell, I'm coming to tell you now that some people like it in the middle and they ain't got no shame because some people like it in the middle, get more loving. Listen, the text says that he moves from the outside to the middle and in the middle Nicodemus engages Jesus and Jesus peels away by telling him the truth. And Nick says, listen, I don't understand how this can all happen. He done left what he thought he knew and came and start telling the truth about what he doesn't know. And that's where God can bless us. When you get off your high horse of trying to know everything and having to, to make people believe that you really got it going on, that's when God can do God's best work with us. Preach fast. This is this raw preaching right here. And so God says to you and to me, when you encounter me, if you let me work with you, you will be engaging me and I will peel away the fake and phony stuff in your life to the point where you'll get so real with me, you'll say, listen, I don't understand what you're doing in my life, but Lord, I want you to keep working on me until I look like you want me to look. I got to go. Let's go. He comes tells the Lord the truth about what he doesn't know and the Lord works on him. I don't know about you, but I want the Lord to work on me. I desire that God work in me and through me and I'm engaging with him. See, Nicodemus does something that most of us won't do. He keeps talking to Jesus. Don't miss it. He encounters, he engages, and he keeps talking. Most of us want to give up talking to the Lord when things don't go the way we want them to go. Nick doesn't get what he wants, but he keeps talking in spite of not getting what he's looking for. Have you ever had the good sense? to keep talking to God, even when God is not answering you the way you want God to answer you. Listen, the definition, the best definition I've ever heard of tenacity is hanging on when giving up looks so easy. Nick hangs in there, even when giving up would have made him look not so bad. Listen, sometimes you got to hang in what you're in until you look better than you did when you came in. I promise you right now, somebody is going through something looking bad, looking ugly, and guess what? You're wondering if you can make it and it looks easier to throw up your hands and say, I'm walking away, I'm done. But I come to tell you, there's a God saying, if you just hang with me, what looks bad now, I'm organizing. What looks ugly now, what smells bad now, I'm fixing. And when I'm done, you won't believe the miracle and the sign that I'm working on through you because you hung in there with me. That's all God wants me to tell you right now. Church folk are church folk because they didn't hang on. But we become disciples and Christian because we hang with God through the messiness of God working stuff out in our life. Listen, I'm going to let you go. I'll hopefully come back next week to work through this a little bit more. But I want you to know you're going to have to deal with church folk. But church folk can become Christian disciples. We can move from the outside to the inside by encountering Christ. And in the encounter, have an engaging experience where we peel away what's fake and phony in our life. Get in the middle with God. Yeah, I'm serious. Get on in the middle. Start singing that Alexander O'Neill. Some people like it in the middle. Watch this. Ain't got no shame. When God is working on you, you ain't got no shame because you know when God gets through with you, what God gives you, the world can't take from you and the world will never be able to understand. That's why Nick said I got to hang in here with him because what I need, nobody else can give. I feel like preaching right here. I'm shutting it down. Listen, this is mighty rich. I don't know where you are in life right now, but I'm certain you might want to give up. But I'm telling you, hang in the middle. Don't have no shame. Hang in there 
Because when you ain't got no shame, God is saying, if you're willing to be embarrassed because I'm working on your case and you want people to know that you see me and I'm working and, and I'm all in your Kool-Aid, God can say, if you can celebrate and you don't mind people knowing that you're working with me in your mess, you can have my glory because I know you're going to give me the, the you're going to tell my story. That's God talking. Listen, you, you have got to be willing sometimes to let people see God working on you, see God working in you, see God fixing you so that when God is finished, God can trust you with your breakthrough because he knows you're going to tell people it was nobody but the Lord. It's been real good today. It's a little lengthy, but that thing is so rich with deep meaning for where we are this week. I pray I get to come back to you on next week. If you are in need of a home, spiritually, virtually, I want to be your pastor. And I need you to engage with me this week. Let me tell you, thank you so much for those of you who tuned in. We were late last week. We had to fix some things. We were a little late last week. I need for you to tune in this week. And I need for you to join my family and the congregation of St. John and the virtual family and give unto the Lord. Bless the Lord with your offering this week. Listen, I believe God wants to use what you're going to give today to make somebody's world great. I believe we're going to be able to feed somebody. I believe we're going to be able to help clothe somebody. I believe we're going to be able to open a door for somebody because you're giving takes place. Listen, when you give today, know that you're going to open a door. Know that you're going to feed somebody. Know that you're going to help clothe somebody. Give somebody supplies to get a job or to get an education. That's what you're giving to this year, this week, particularly this Sunday. Join me. May the Lord bless you. The, the new cash app is on the screen. Will you please use it to bless the kingdom of God so that somebody can go on anyhow. I love you. God loves you. And I pray the blessing of God. Let me bless you before you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the face of God shine on you. And may God give you his peace until we can see each other again. God loves you. So do I. Be in Korea.